Welcome to Lock Sportscast, your weekly source for Lock Sport news. This is episode 105, recorded June 12th, 2022. I'm your host, Charles Grant. In today's episode, Master Lock Strikes Again, Locksmith Murdered on the Job, The Watergate Burglary and Other Criminals, Products, Meetups, Sales, Giveaways, and More. You can subscribe to the audio version of the show on most podcast apps and at thelocksportscast.com. You can subscribe to the video version on YouTube, Odyssey, or Apple Podcasts. Links to stories discussed will be in the show notes. YouTube and some apps limit the length of show notes and the ability to post full links, but you can always find all of the links at thelocksportscast.com. First up in the news, we have an article on Hackaday called Anyone Can Be the Master of This Master Lock Safe. What do you get when you have a $5 logic analyzer, a Sentry safe produced by Masterlock, and some free time? The discovery of a serious vulnerability, that's what. So evidently the keypad and the lock controller communicate over a standard UART connection, and the keypad simply passes the code to the lock controller, as it should. The lock controller does all of the checking of the code from there, so no problem on that part. However, This person discovered that when changing the code, you are required to enter a factory code for that safe first. But the controller doesn't actually require the code before accepting the serial data packet for the change request. As he discovered, all you have to do is program an Arduino to send the change code request, change the code, and then send the new code, and you get the safe open. That simple. He also developed a new safe controller to go inside of the safe that will act properly. But uh, how many actual people who own this safe are going to go through that trouble? Serious, serious problems (laughs) at Master Lock. And then unfortunately, we have some sad news here. Uh, This article was entitled, We Had Big Dreams. Locksmith, father of four, found dead inside burning work van in DeKalb. This is out of Georgia. It says a mobile locksmith was found dead in his burning work van in DeKalb County, leaving behind a wife and four children. Peter McGrath, 36, was identified as the victim. The cause of death has been ruled a homicide. His wife told reporters he did not deserve what happened to him. He was a loving father. He was just an amazing human being. DeKalb County police found McGrath around 12.30 a.m. on Sunday. McGrath owned his own locksmith company, and his wife said he had just taken a call for a job around 8 p.m. the night before. She said, I never heard from him again. He walked out the door. He was gone forever. The police have not announced a potential motive during their investigation yet. However, his wife says, I do believe in my heart that he was targeted. He was set up. The people that did this knew what they were doing when they called my husband. Neighbors said that the burning van was sitting on their street for several hours before they heard an explosion. McGrath was the sole provider for his family. A GoFundMe has been set up to help his family get by. Uh, His wife is also asking witnesses who may be able to help find her husband's killer to please come forward. And checking the GoFundMe before recording, it looks like they have raised about $42,000 of the $50,000 goal. So good to go there. I will have links to the story and the GoFundMe in the show notes, just in case anybody is feeling like helping them out. It would be very nice of you to do so. And I would just like to reiterate to all of my listeners who are locksmiths or who are considering becoming locksmiths, Please, please use extreme caution. We've had lots of stories of locksmiths being robbed at gunpoint or, in this case, uh, being murdered. Possibly as part of a robbery gone wrong here this time. We don't know, but it's dangerous out there right now. And please, please be suspicious and use caution. If you have to turn down a job because it just doesn't feel right, it's better to to lose out on that little bit of money than to than for your family to lose you. So just be careful, please. All right, and this next thing sent in by iFisk is actually old. The uh, auction has ended, but this was a burglar's lock pick set 
framed display. This was an item being auctioned off online, and the item description was a 16 by 18 and a quarter inch frame consisting of 27 piece lock pick set confiscated from a burglar in 1935. Sizes range from 1 and 5 eighths inch long to nearly 6 and a half inches long. Set includes a variety of picks, each with different keyed teeth designs, nine featuring double ends. The picks appear to have been handmade out of steel, but uh, are well done with great detail to key teeth. Bottom center of frame contains engraved plaque reading Burglar Lock Pick Set Confiscated 1935 Livingston, Montana. Picks are attached to an aged piece of thin cardboard, likely part of a local police force for teaching or display. I've never really seen anything quite like this. These are an interesting set of picks. Some of them appear to be similar to comb picks. And then we have what appear to be a lot of different potential biddings for lever locks, maybe. Um, anyway, very cool, interesting set. I recommend you go check it out. Look at the pictures. If anybody has any feedback on what exactly these are or what they do, it would be really appreciated if you could share that back here on the show or just leave it in the comments or send me a note and I would love to follow up on this because these are some really interesting, unique looking items. Uh, link in the show notes as always. In Arkansas, Springdale, the worst case scenario survival experience is now open at the JTL shop in downtown Springdale. The Worst Case Scenario Survival Experience is a full-body play challenge that is great for families, kids, adults, and all ages. It offers physical challenges to provide essential instructions for what you need to know when facing unexpected but possible real-life scenarios. You can test your skills in the survival gym, navigate a simulated avalanche in the giant ball pit, or jump from one moving vehicle to another on the train jump platform. You can also learn to change your appearance with common household items at the disguise display. There's also a lockpick wall where you can try your lockpicking skills. The lock barrels are made of clear lucite, so you can see inside as you tinker. Anyway, it looks like just kind of a fun uh, go play with your family, your kids. Let them play around learning to jump between moving vehicles and pick locks and just a, an all-around interesting experience. I think I've covered it before in a different location, but it is now in Springdale, Arkansas, if anybody in that area wants to check it out. Moving on to community news. First up, big congrats to Panda Frog. Mini Panda Frog 2 has arrived. Was He was born on the actual due date, June 8th. And so Panda Frog's giveaway is officially over, but I just wanted to say congratulations, Panda Frog, on the new member of your family. Hope everybody is healthy and happy. And a congratulations to Chris Capoon on publishing his 2000th video on YouTube. I'll have a link in the show notes to that video. Does a lot of thanking of people that have helped him on the way, but congratulations, 2000 videos. That is a lot of time and effort. So. Appreciate all your hard work and keep it up. Chris's channel is one of the ones that really inspired me to think about finally starting to make videos on, uh, on lock picking that and the belt system requiring a video on some things. So between those two, uh, that's why you're getting me here. So congratulations, Chris. And Dark Arts Lock Picking put up a tweet that said, Hey everyone, looking at doing something fun and a bit of a change for a video on DELP, looking to do some interviews with people from all aspects of the security world. So locksmiths to hackers to locksport people, let me know if you would like to join an interview or a talk. And so I will have a link to his tweet in the show notes. You all know where his YouTube channel is too. So you can head over there and let him know if you're interested. I know people have been clamoring for interviews since I took a break from doing them because I was so busy. So. Keep your eye on the Dark Arts Lockpicking YouTube channel, and maybe you'll get some over there. I do plan on picking up and doing some over here on the Lock Sportscast again later this year, as time permits. So, also stay tuned for that. We have a couple new blog posts. The first is on the Tool Black Bag blog. It's called ATM Lockpicking at HITB Cyber Week. 
And it's an interesting examination of the ATM in the payment village. Highlights include an Abloy DD lock and what appears to be two Group 2 mechanical combination locks on the internal safe door. So much better built than some. And over at Lock Judge, they have posted a new article on Yale Locks. The article does include a section called History of Yale Lock Company that might be worth reading if you don't already know that history. And for products, we have several this week. First off, Multi Pick Elite Dimple Lock Tensioner number SP 62, designed by Lock Noob. The description says, especially designed for Multi Pick by Lock Noob to suit the special characteristics of a dimple lock. Also supports cylinders from North American manufacturers. This dimple lock tensioner is made from Multi Pick's well known high quality spring steel, which ensures a sensitive feedback. So quite a few new products from Multipick designed by Lock Noob this uh, last couple of weeks. So there's a new one to check out. And Bare Bones has announced their most recent new addition, the Bone Tweezers with Interchangeable Replaceable Tip. Uh, so this next product from Bare Bones Lock Picking is stainless steel tweezers with interchangeable and replaceable tips. They say finding the right tweezers suitable for every lock sport task is near impossible. So what's the solution? Find one with interchangeable replaceable tips. You can always have the right tip regardless of which lock you are gutting or whatever task you are completing. It says the tips are made from hard ABS plastic, so it's easy to sand, cut, shape, if not 100% the profile you need. You can even mix and match between different tip profiles for even more variety. Tweezer handle is made from stainless steel and perfectly usable even without any tip. They currently provide nine tip profiles, uh, so they are confident there is at least one suitable for your task, with replacement tips around $2 and bare tweezer handles around $5. And I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but uh, they do have a link here to a YouTube review of the product, and I will link that, of course, in the show notes and uh, the link to the product as well. And they also announced that Bare Bones is now an authorized reseller for Law Lock Tools. And they say big thanks to Tepene uh, for orchestrating and making this partnership happen. They say the move is to expand the bare bones range quickly and provide products for the intermediate to expert lock sporter from a local Aussie supplier. This means Australian lock sporters can have Law Lock Tools products at the equivalent Law Lock Tools retail price within days, not the typical weeks to months. They also say this union will come with a range of custom DLP handles for both pick suppliers that will be reviewed and showcased in the coming weeks. So that is uh, some really good news for those of you down in Australia. I know it can be very difficult uh, to get products from the US and the UK all the way down there. So this is a big step in making sure that you can get them in reasonable time and for reasonable shipping costs. Very cool. Moving on to meetups. First off, uh, looks like this weekend, Friday, June 17th through Saturday, June 18th, B-Sides Cleveland. If you're in that area, be sure to check it out. Registration is open for LockCon. LockCon is scheduled for Thursday, the 25th of August to Sunday, the 28th of August. So be sure to check that out. If you're in the, what is this, Barlow area? DEFCON, August 11th through the 14th. Uh, of course, in Vegas. And they also have their call for volunteers open. I will include the form if you want to help volunteer in the show notes as well. And SaintCon is going to be October 25th through the 28th in Provo, Utah. And I will have a link to that in the show notes as well. Moving on to the Lockpickers United belts, we have some stats that I missed last week. So the current stats for the number of belts out there, we have on the Discord, we have 179 white belts, 301 yellow belts, 601 orange belts, 349 green belts, 183 blue belts, 98 purple, 48 brown, 49 red, and 89 black. And then we also have a posting for the 
Reddit stats, the number of belts over there, which mostly includes people that are also accounted for in the Discord. Uh, keep that in mind. White belts, 964. Yellow, 1,581. Orange belts, 2,001. Green belts, 710. Blue belts, 246. Purple, 106. Brown, 53. Red, 43. And black, 87 for a total of 5,791 people on Reddit taking part in the Lockpickers United belt system. And we have some new belts to announce that I don't think were quite accounted for in these numbers because most of them came after the numbers were posted. So, purple, we have Cajun Lockpick, Land Spy Key, Rock Race Game Repeat, and Even Fleur. Congratulations to all of you on your purple belts. We have a new red belt for the greenish one. And we have a few black belts here. So the first one says, please join me in welcoming Yagius. Uh, Yagius? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. To black belt. For those of you who have not met him, one of our Reddit-focused members, he has produced some fantastic cutaways, DD tools, and has demonstrated his skill by picking some serious locks, including the Abloy Classic and Asa 700. So nicely done. This next one says, it gives me great pleasure to announce another black belt from the land of Vegemite. Regen or Regen has made a number of interesting things in his journey, including a fascinating open SCAD pick design tool. He has proved his skill by manipulating group two, producing some lovely handmade cutaways and by picking the West 917 and the Asa 700. Congratulations to you. And the final one, we have another black belt joining us today, 206. For this momentous achievement, he picked the Dom IX Twin Star, the EVA 3KS, cracked a Group 2 safe lock, and impressioned a cursed Lockwood 120 gifted to him by the one and only Gravity Karma. Congratulations to all of you on your new belts. If you would like to take part in the Lockpickers United belt system or learn what it's all about, there are lots of links in the show notes to different videos, to the official rules, all that stuff. Be sure to check those out and join in the fun. Over at speedlocks.org, we have some new records. So the American 1100 six pin picked by PandaFrog in 9.68 seconds. Quick set smart key Gen 2 also by PandaFrog in 24.2 seconds. The Abyss 6530 by Goose7732 in 3.967 seconds. And the Abyss 645 tie slash 30 by Goose7732 in 2.5 seconds. We have first records on the Goal Grand B, Grand 5, by Rain in 3 minutes 39.466 seconds. And the Commando 1000 by Pandafrog in 8.5 four seconds so congratulations good work on all of those fast picking times and with that i'd like to say thank you to people that made this episode possible producers for this episode include the patreon subscribers we have jimmy longs panda frog michael gilchrist starlock williams brain dave doobie ciphered Lebon's locksport journey pat from uncensored tactical three raccoons and a coat Cherell, dr hogmaster clayton howard aka cool tune mog john Locke. Rackio, Mr. Picker, Cranky Lock Picker, JHP Picking, Barebones Lock Picking, Deadbolt Cafe, NWA Lock Picker, Snake, Chief Content Producer, I Fisk. Other content producers for this episode include Albert LaBelle, Barebones Lock Picking, Cheryl, Chris Capoon, Cleveland Locks, Dark Arts Lock Picking, Gravity Karma, Ian, James Randolph, Jeff Moss, Joe Picks, Joshua Gonzalez, Newhouse Lock and Key, Michael Gilchrist, Panda Frog, Rain, and Tony Varelli. Thank you to all of you for your support big turnout this week. I really, really appreciate it. But please don't forget this show is only possible because of that sport. And quite often when I announce that we had a quite a bit of support for a week, the next week is pretty dry. So it's a good chance for you to get your name in that uh, chief content producer slot by sending in some information for next week. That's the number one way you can help this show keep going is by sending in your news links, events, giveaway information, anything you have that you think the community should know about or would like to know about, send it to podcast at the locksportscast.com or any of the other methods listed in the show notes. Don't forget to share the show with your lock picking friends, leave a review or comment or a thumbs up or whatever the platform you subscribe on uh, allows. And 
And don't forget to subscribe on your preferred platform. If you want, you can donate via PayPal or subscribe on Patreon if you want to help financially. If you support the show with the donation or information I use in the show, I will give you credit in the show and in the show notes, just like the people I mentioned earlier. Just a reminder, I'm always looking for stories that are interesting in Locksport, whether it's your journey through Locksport, something that happened to you because you're in Locksport or you're a locksmith or whatever. As long as it's an interesting story involving you that happened with locks, send it in. I would love to read it and possibly share it on the show. Just remember to keep it reasonable length, a uh, few minutes. And if you would like to send feedback, you can go to the locksportscast.com slash contact. Feedback can be confidential, or I can share it on the show. If you want to share it on the show, keep it reasonable length, polite, work family safe, no politics, no drama. All right, Nyfisk sent me a link to a story on CNN's website. It was entitled, Six Mistakes That Led to the 1972 Watergate Burglars Being Caught. This is evidently a kind of a promotional article for a special they're going to be running on the Watergate burglary. For those of you who are younger and may not be familiar with all the details of the Watergate break-in, it might be something interesting to watch. The article gives a few more details that I'm going to cover here, but I'll go over the highlights. So their mission was to break into the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington, bug the room, and photograph documents. June 17, 1972 became an infamous day. The burglary set off a series of actions that brought down Republican President Richard Nixon, the only U.S. president to resign. The break-in was performed by a group that they named the Plumbers. Their first action in 1971, the Plumbers broke into the psychiatrist's office of a military analyst, Daniel Ellsberg, to photograph the psychiatrist's notes on Ellsberg to try and smear him in the press. The plumber's objective was to enter the office and leave undetected, but they couldn't open the door, which they had secretly left unlocked earlier in the day, so they broke a window, creating a scene. Then they didn't find any psychiatrist notes, and they left empty-handed. A while later, the plumbers were tasked with breaking into the DNC office at the Watergate Hotel. The five men tasked with breaking in made multiple attempts at the task, the first time they failed completely because the door was locked and they didn't have the ability to get through it at that point. The second time they didn't appear to know where the campaign chairman's office was located so they bugged an empty, empty conference room. And the third attempt was intended to correct the previous errors. They wanted to move a bug. They had three more bugs which they wanted planted and they were also going to put a listening device in a smoke detector. The crew had placed tape over every door latch to prevent the self-locking doors from engaging from the basement to the sixth floor where the DNC offices were. James McCord, a former CIA officer, was the wiretapping expert on the team, and it was he who insisted on taping the doors, and he was asked, did you remember to remove all the tape? He said yes, but he hadn't. Watergate security guard Frank Wills spotted the tape plastered over one door's latch. He called the police at 1.47 a.m. and reported the break-in, and they had a lookout man across the street with a walkie-talkie to alert the burglars if anyone was coming, but McCord had turned down the volume on his walkie-talkie, so when the lookout man could see the D.C. police moving towards the headquarters, the burglars didn't get the alert. When the lookout man finally was able to notify the crew, it was too late, Police were already in the building. They spotted the five men who were all wearing business suits and surgical gloves crouching behind desks. What police discovered in the men's possession made them even more suspicious. The men had $100 bills with serial numbers in sequence, lock picks, door jimmies, cameras, a shortwave receiver that could pick up police calls, and three pen-sized tear gas guns, according to the 1972 Washington Post report. It also says that when the police caught them, they had something like 35 rolls of undeveloped film and very advanced cameras with them. So they weren't just looking to bug, they were, and they weren't just looking for a couple of files, they were looking for a ton of information. But without a backup plan in case of arrest, the burglars were cornered into revealing some key information that morning in the courtroom. When one of the suspects was questioned, the judge said, where have you worked? And the lead burglar, McCord, said, CIA. In the months that followed, FBI agents, journalists, and congressional investigations began to piece together the details of the scandal that pointed 
to White House involvement and ultimately Richard Nixon's resignation. Such a weird group of guys. I mean, here they got a guy from the CIA, and he's the one making the majority of the mistakes. So, <laughs> it's hard to believe that that actually took place. Moving on to other criminal news. This article, also sent in by IFISC, stolen box trailer contains Colorado model railroad setup that took years of effort. So, thieves stole a trailer that contained a 40 by 16 foot model railroad display that was uh, broken down into sections and stored in the trailer. The group that made it calls the setup the Slick X Line. The group is now seven model railroading enthusiasts. They built the display 14 years ago. It took two years to make. Each year since then, they've tried to make some improvements. They take it around to different shows, set it up and display it to children and other people who remember when the railroads were dominant. The trailer was stored at Apogee Industrial Park in Watkins in eastern Arapahoe County. When they went to go pick up the trailer, they found it missing, and it appeared that the lock on the hitch had been knocked off. The owner said, quote, they snapped it off with something big and strong. The Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office is working to obtain video from company at the industrial complex that may show the theft in action. It's not clear yet exactly when the trailer was stolen. There was a follow-up article, trailer containing treasured model railroad display found with some parts missing. So the trailer was spotted by a man who lived in a, a neighborhood near Tower Road in Aurora, and he called the police and they came and they ticketed the trailer, but didn't go any further. The man later discovered that that was the trailer he had read about, but by then it had disappeared again only to reappear in the 2500 block of Carson Way, also in Aurora. And then an Aurora police officer had it towed to an impound lot. The model railroad display modules were still inside and intact, but controllers, various supplies, and miniature buildings, including a mining building and a grain elevator that was scratch-built and a police station, are still missing, and there are currently no suspects. But it just goes to show again, a single lock on a trailer is not security if it's, it doesn't even matter if it's stored behind a fence in a lot. If all you have is a couple of padlocks, one on the gated fence and one on the trailer, and it's not monitored in any way, that is not enough security. Not nowadays. This last article is entitled, Suspect Used Lock Picking Devices to Get into Holly Grimm's home. This is out of Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and it says the suspect is accused of stalking and killing his co-worker Holly Grimm in 2013. Detective Raymond Judge took the stand Wednesday morning in the ninth day of testimony in the murder trial. He talked about how he had recovered journals in the suspect's house that span between 2008 and 2012. They show evidence that he was keeping track of Grimm down to the minute the suspect has maintained his innocence, but prosecutors went over evidence Wednesday morning they believe contradicts that claim. The suspect himself admitted that he had been to Grimm's house twice to deliver a washer and a dryer, and his blood was found on the door of Grimm's house. Investigators also determined he had made a phone call the morning she went missing in 2013, and the location showed he was in Lower Saucon, Saucon? Township not at his property in Ross Township. He was also late to work that day, telling his company and investigators that he had a flat tire. Investigators also mentioned they found lock-picking devices in his basement, which is why they believe there were no signs of forced entry at Grimm's house. So it sounds like a, a very sad case. Um, unfortunately, she had a stalker, and sounds like he got to her, um, and possibly with the use of lockpicks. So, hate to see that. All right, moving on to sales. Bare bones lock picking. We have a new code. It's down under monkey ten for a ten percent discount store wide on top of any other discounts, and that expires at the end of the month on June thirtieth at barebonesLockPicking.com. So, if you're in the Australia area, head over there, check it out. Be sure to look for when they have the law lock tools coming in. Check out their other new products and use your discount code. 
over at South Ord. The Jackknife Lockpick set is on sale through the day this releases, June 13th. 20% discount off the Jackknife Lockpick set. Discount code is Daddy's Day 22, and that is only good through the 13th of June at southord.com. Newhouse Lock and Key, 10% off code is in the show notes. It's the Lock Sports cast without the A at the end. So check that out. That expires at the end of the month. Thinkpeterson.com, Peterson Locksmith Tools. They have a category for overstock where they have a bunch of stuff on sale. Be sure to check that out. If you shop at lockpickmall.com, we have code for dark arts lock picking which is dark vip we have a code for albert labelle which is albert and we have a code for joe picks which is joe picks all three of those are valid at lockpickmall.com so pick your favorite one and use it over at 3dlocksport.com you have 10 percent off with the code lscast10 on all of your favorite 3d printed locksport accessories and of course we have the ever-present 15% off at makealocks.com with the code BUYMAKO and 10% off at uklockpickers.co.uk with the code GIFT. For giveaways this week, we have Lock Noob's 100,000 sub giveaway with Lockmaster Picks. Sounds like they have a total of 10 winners. It's being run through Gleam.io. Be sure to check that out. And of course, CLK Supplies hashtag Lockboss giveaway. CLK Supplies is a locksmith supplier, so they always have good stuff in there. If you're into giveaways, check it out. And remember that this show is listener-supported. The number one thing you can do to help out is send me an information that I can use in the show. Large, small. If you think I've heard it, I probably haven't. If you think everybody sent it, they probably haven't. So send it anyway. Flood me with emails and tweets and direct messages. Send it all my way. I can't get enough information. I love you all. Thank you for sticking with me for two years. Keep it legal. (laughs) 